Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. I was speaking with somebody uh, last week, uh, talking about the battle with sin, another minister. And you know, he shared this little thing at a minister's fraternal breakfast. And I'm thinking, man, it's Christianity 101, understanding this, that it's not about battling with sin. We don't battle with sin. Jesus battled with sin. He battled with it on the cross. He dealt with it on the cross. God has an answer for sin. It's called death. That thing's got to die. That's the answer. It says here, in Romans 6.23, But now having been set free from sin, well that's 22, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, it's a gift, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We have a gift. God has given us a gift. You don't have to work for it. We're supposed to repent from dead works. It's not something you have to earn. But so many of us are trying to earn something with God. Neil opened last week by asking, do we really want God? I thought that was a brilliant question. we meditating on that. Do we really want God? Because we pray and we pray passionately and believing for a move of the Spirit and for the power of the Spirit, for the life of the Spirit to come. You know what happens when He does. He, he brings something fresh. And so, you know, we've got to deal with the basics. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. You and I are new creatures if we are in Christ. Are you in Christ today? We're new creatures. Old things have passed away. That means dead. It doesn't mean, you know, you cover them up. But sometimes we get this thing about our sin that is just covered up. No, it's dead. Sharon brought that verse this morning. We have died with Christ. The whole of Romans 6 is about water baptism. And water baptism is an image of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That when we go under the waters of baptism, fully immersed, going down under the water, we die with Christ. We're identifying with his death, burial. You don't sprinkle a bit of dirt on somebody when they die, you know. You bury them six foot under. How many metres is that? Nearly two. You know, nothing can put its roots down except for maybe some big trees. It can't get it down that far. You're, you're so far down, that's it. You're, it's, it's a real burial. So when we go under the waters, it's not a sprinkling of water. You get buried. You go under the waters, identifying with the burial of Christ. When you come up out of the water, you, we identify with his resurrection coming up out of the grave. I'm just grateful we don't have to identify with three days. <laughs> three minutes, we're going to stay down there. <laughs> we come, it's an identification. See, we have an old nature. We're born in sin, and it's not wrestling ourselves with sin. The answer for it is death. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in him. The old nature. We have an old nature. Hello? We have a carnal nature. And the answer for it is death. Identify with his death. Then we also identify with his life. If any man is in Christ, old things have passed away, all things have become new. I am a new creature. Second, uh, sorry, um, Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24 says it like this. Put off the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Put off the old nature and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, putting on the new man which is created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. My new creature is, is, is of God. It's created righteous, doesn't struggle with sin, doesn't wrestle with thinking wrong, doesn't wrestle with evil stuff, doesn't wrestle at all. It's created righteous. It's created holy. I am created holy. I've been born of God. Hello? Are you seeing this? So I've got an old nature and I've got a new nature. I've got to put off the old, consider it dead, and I walk in the new. There is no wrestle with the new nature, with sin and with unrighteousness. But I've got to change the spirit of my mind. Now that is not spooky. It's not sort of weird and mystical, changing the spirit of your mind. 
No, it just means I think differently. Hello? Are you here? Uh, so I've got to learn how to think the thoughts of God. The Bible says, I think it's in Isaiah, says my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are high above. And sometimes we use that as a justification in this sort of put it out there place. It's too hard. We can't reach it. It's out there somewhere or other. But that's not what the new covenant tells us. The new covenant tells us that I have the mind of Christ. Put on the new mind. Think like Jesus thought. That's what it tells us. That I have the mind of Christ. Putting on the mind of Christ. That Jesus had this mind thinking not only of his own things but also on the things of others. So it's, it's an other-minded. It's not thinking about my own stuff. Peter was telling me this morning, working out with all these bus drivers, you know, we, we've got to think about them. You put them first and the whole balance shifts. So it's not just about my problems, but it's about serving others, working with others. But it's also having the right way of thinking about others. Because so often we get into carnal thinking. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans chapter 8. So I, I, I've got to have the right thinking about how I think. I, I've got to think the thoughts of God. And so often it's so easily to, to just think naturally about others, particularly when they're full of sin and offensive. But here's the thing about sinners, they will sin. I know it's deep. But people sometimes mess up. People sometimes are offensive. People sometimes are selfish. And so they will offend you by their own selfishness. They'll tread on you, they'll you know, speak about you, they'll do things. But the Bible tells us, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. Or is it the other way around? So it, it, it's about having the mind of God. How do we do this? How do we get the, the spirit of our mind shifted? Well, the starting place is to get the word of God into us. So then the spirit of God can begin to bring scriptures to us that speak to us. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, actually every night, and uh, uh, I'll have these scriptures just flowing through me and God will just be speaking to me, you know, about one thing after another and all these verses will come to me. God will be speaking to me. That's why I love coming into the presence of God. We come to the prayer meetings, we pray and the Spirit of God comes in and out of that place in the presence of God, the thoughts of God begin to well up out of our inner life. The rivers of living water begin to speak to us and God speaks to us. And, and the, the joy and the life of it and how to think about others, how to and the wisdom of God and the strategies of God and how to think right. We've got to shift the spirit of our thinking. Are you hearing me? So when God comes, when God comes, and Sharon brought this magnificent word on Tuesday night, that when God moves, he's going to bring a fresh spirit of truth and with it will come revelation of fresh truth. Fresh truth does not do away with old truth. It builds line upon line, precept upon precept. But when fresh revelation comes, it has an energy and faith comes. For we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And faith comes when you get fresh revelation from God. Are you hearing me this morning? Who wants fresh faith? Anybody? Come on, we want something fresh from God. But out of this freshness that flows from heaven, the fresh move of the Spirit, the fresh wind of the Spirit, we've got to be able to grab a hold of it because sometimes our mind is still so carnal we can't grab it. Our mind is still so wrapped up in carnality that we can't walk with it, that we can't see the, the depth of it. God has been showing me some things that are still, I, I think, I've got to step up if I'm going to walk in faith for it. He says he will rule until all things, enemies, are under his feet. Is that right? But he is the head, we are the body. So if we are the body, we are his hands and feet. So he's going to rule through us until we overcome. Do you see that? Because we are his feet. So he wants us to overcome. He's already won the victory. He's already seated at the right hand of the Father. He's already got all authority in heaven and earth. But he is going to rule and reign until you and I, his body, also overcomes. You see that? 
He, he wants us to step into this. It's about thinking differently, changing the spirit of how we think. Let me give you... <clears throat> I'm rushing in front of myself. Got so much here. We've got the old and the new. The old must die so we can walk in the new. It says the same thing in Romans 12, 1 to 2. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. It's the same image. That thing's got to die. That you might know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's about hearing God's voice, God's strategies, God's wisdom to know what God wants to do. You've got to put off the old, put on the new. Change the spirit of your mind. We'll be transformed by that. We become who we're supposed to be when God shows us how to think, how to think right about others, how to walk, how to walk through life, what to do and how to do it. And oftentimes it's in our workplace. It's in our homes. It's in our families. It's, it's not just in the church environment. It's, it's where the rubber hits the road. How do I lead my wayward kids? How do I deal with conflict? How do I, how do I manage the nasty neighbour? You know, stuff that every one of us has to deal with. That's where we need the mind of God, isn't it? Hello? It, it, it's not just about the, the spiritual environment. It's about our daily walk. Jesus said, pick up your cross daily. Again, he's going through the same image, the same picture, dealing with your carnal nature. Take up your carnal stuff, deal with it daily. Take up your cross daily. Let the old thinking, it's got to die. So then you can put on the new. Not just about dealing with our sins of the past or whatever, but it's about how we think and allowing the, the wisdom of God to permeate us and to think like God thinks, so that we can be who God has called us to be, so that we can have the influence that he wants us to, to have, so that we can walk in the victory that he wants us to walk in, so that we can have the overcoming demonstration of God in our midst. Hello? Let, let me show you this. Let's turn to John chapter 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Went to bed with one shoe on. I got the different thing. John chapter nine. <laughs> As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. The whole chapter is about this blind man, and the most amazing verse to me is verse one. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus was just passing by. He was just passing by. He saw a man who was blind from birth. You know, Jesus said, I don't do anything except I, uh, my Father in heaven shows me. But he was just passing by. In John chapter 3, there was a man called Nicodemus. And Jesus said to him, you know, when you're under the tree, I saw you. Nicodemus was amazed by that. He said, oh, you must be the Messiah. And he said, oh, you're a, you call me the Messiah because I just tell you that? And I'm thinking, you know, Jesus was praying and spending some time with the Father and as he was spending that time, God showed him Nicodemus under the tree and he saw Nicodemus, showed him that he was going to speak to him there. And so then when it actually happened, he'd already known it was coming. And so he said, when you were under the tree, I saw you there. But here in John chapter 9, it wasn't like that. Jesus was just passing by. He was just going for a walk. <laughs> he was just going for a walk and he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples came out with this question and they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And it's amazing how easily we come to natural thinking. We think about sin and we think about judgment. I suppose no, never have you have, none of you have ever thought about judging somebody else. You're maybe more holy than me. <laughs> Whose sin? Whose fault was this? Well, you know, how come he was born blind? It must be a penalty of sin. Must be. And Jesus said, a totally different perspective, a different way of thinking. It's not about that. 
It's, it's neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Long, long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the blind man had to blindly go and find the pool of Siloam, had to wash his face. I mean, what else does he do? He's got mud on his face. He's got to wash now. So he went and had a wash in the pool of Siloam. And then he could see. He was born blind. I think, why did Jesus, why did he make clay? Well, I'm thinking, the man was born blind. He probably didn't have any eyeballs. And God had to give him something. Jesus had to give him something that eyeballs could be made from. You and I were made from the dust of the ground, originally with Adam. Well, that's we made Adam. We all come from Adam. So he, he got a bit of, bit of dirt. This will do. Give something here. Make some eyeballs out of clay and spit. Put them on his face. Then he had to have an act of faith. He went and washed in the pool of Siloam, washed it off, and he could see. Fantastic, incredible miracle. But Jesus was just passing by. The disciples, instead of looking for the miracle, instead of looking for the redemption, instead of thinking, Here's, God can help you, instead of thinking the power of God is here and he can transform you, instead of thinking the answer of God, instead of thinking the strategies of God, they just thought judgment. Natural thinking. And it is so easy for you and I just to think natural thinking. Just to think, that's it. This is obviously sin here. This bloke's got a problem. Rather than looking for the answer of God. Rather than looking for the purpose of God. Is this making sense? We're going to change the spirit of our mind. We're going to change how we think. Jesus was just passing by. Answers are everywhere. Rather, should I say, um, the, the opportunities are everywhere. Opportunities for God to work are everywhere. They're around about us all the time. Opportunities, are, are, all you've got to do is just pass by and look for them. But if we're not thinking with the right spirit, if we're not thinking, you know, we might think, oh, gee, I've got to align with an organisation like Care Outreach and I've got to get uh, you know, all this uh, opportunity and they're going to send me to a place and I'll go out there and they're going to tell me the people to go to and I'll go and knock on the door and, you know, and I'll go and, and, and shepherd those people. And, and you know, if that's what it takes, well, that's fantastic and you'll do an outstanding job because you're putting your best foot forward and having a go. But opportunities are everywhere. Jesus was just passing by. They're everywhere if we, we think like Christ. And I'm looking for it now. I'm saying, God, where are the opportunities? How, how, how do we walk with you? How do we change the spirit of our mind and allow the spirit of it to flow so that we can walk in life and truth and wholeness? How do we walk in it, spirit of God? Are you, are you seeing this this morning? So we washed. But there was all this stuff that happened after this. His parents said, oh, he looks like our son. He, he's, now he can see. Something's happening here. He's got a miracle. The Pharisees said, how did you get your sight back? The Pharisees weren't interested in the fact that he'd received a miracle. They were interested in the fact that he got a miracle by the wrong person. And how judgmental can we be? Sometimes we get so hung up on, on the wrong things instead of looking for the answer of God and the life of God and, the, and what God wants to do. And, and the Pharisees ended up kicking him out of church, kicked him out of the synagogue and had this great bit of argument with him. And, they, and, and again and again, I've told you how it happened, he says. I've told you. I met a man called Jesus. He said, what do you look like? I don't know. I was blind. <laughs> And Jesus met him later and, and uh, they had this whole conversation. But you see, it's so easy for us to think naturally. Here's another one. 
Let's look at this one. This is powerful. John chapter 8, the previous chapter. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. It was early in the morning. And he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. He was in the temple. He wasn't out on the, you know, in the garden. He was in the temple. Now the temple was a holy place and it was built with, with you know, stone and, and all this beautiful stuff in the temple. The scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. They didn't bring him the couple. For the best of my knowledge, it takes two. They brought the woman. If you understand the, the situation back then for a woman... All it took was for a man to declare three times, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and the woman was cast out and she was divorced. That's an easy divorce. And a tough for ladies, tough for women, tough situation for this lady. So she was caught in adultery. So they brought the woman and they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? They said this, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. And much has been said of what Jesus wrote on the ground as he wrote on the finger, uh, wrote on the ground with his finger. But you remember, they were in the temple with a floor of stone. And they don't tell us what he wrote on the ground. But they give us this image, this picture. They referred to Moses gave us the law. Moses gave us the law and he said, a lady caught in adultery should be stoned. Jesus put it in their context. Originally, when Moses got the law, he went up to the mountain and God spoke to him and God wrote with his finger on tablets of stone and gave them the Ten Commandments. Here we have the Son of God writing with his finger on the floor of stone and he put it in their context. Then he stood up and said, Who amongst you is without sin? So Jesus did not bring condemnation. He did not bring judgment which we so often do. He did not bring this, but he put it in their context. And the image that we have is of God writing on the stone with his finger. And the holiness of God. Now, he might have written the Ten Commandments. doesn't really matter. But that was the image of God writing on stone with his finger in the holy presence of God. And Jesus, we know, was anointed by God. He says, you know, I've been anointed to set the captives free, to bring deliverance to the blind, etc., etc. He was anointed. So Jesus allowed the presence of God as he came and he, and, and he wrote on the ground representing God, writing down the, the commandments with the finger of God onto the stone and the presence of God coming into that place brought deep conviction to the Pharisees. And one by one they left. And then the woman said, it was before Jesus, and Jesus said, where are your accusers? He said, they've gone. And he said, neither do I accuse you. Just go and sin no more. See, a different way of thinking, a different spirit. Having a mind of Christ. Not bringing judgment, but bringing redemption. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We know John 3.16, that's John 3.17. God does not want to bring condemnation, not bring in judgment, not bringing that which destroys people, but bring in redemption. Have this mind in you which was also in Christ, thinking about the only things of others. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. No greater love as a man than this, that he laid down his life Sometimes we've got to die to our selfish responses wanting to judge 
to allow the life of God to flow. Are you hearing this this morning? So it, 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 this image that Jesus brought. Now some of us read that scripture and think, that's fantastic. Jesus gave it to those Pharisees. Anybody think like that? Now isn't that judgment? Isn't that just as much judgment as they were bringing against the woman? But Jesus did not bring judgment to the Pharisees. He brought conviction of sin. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And the goodness of God came to the Pharisees just as much as it did to the woman. You see that? It is so beautiful, so incredibly powerful to shift the spirit of our mind so we begin to see redemption, we begin to see encounter, we begin to see the life of God flow rather than judgment. It works for everyone there. He brought redemption. He brought the grace of God. He brought the life of the spirit. He brought the truth of it. When God works, friends, when God works, everybody gets touched by it. It's not you're right and I'm wrong. It's not one or the other. Everybody is brought into this place. You know, Sharon brought that word on, on Tuesday night, that the spirit of truth will come and those who are pressed into his presence will receive fresh revelation of the truth. And I think, you know, what happens when fresh revelation comes? What happens when the spirit of life comes? What happens is that people catch a hold of the fresh truth and the fresh life and begin to express it in their lives and begin to walk it out. They begin to do things like write new songs. And, you know, they begin to take a hold of it and bring the liberty and life of the fresh truth that comes and whatever it is. I, I, you know, my prayer, humbly before God, is that I would have the courage to be able to embrace the fresh move of the Spirit, the fresh revelation life that he brings. I do not want to be an old wineskin. Are you hearing me this morning? I, I want to be able to carry the freshness that he brings with fresh songs, the fresh spirit of it, the fresh life of it. But so easily we can step into judgment when the fresh comes. Oh, I haven't heard that song before. I don't like it. Well, there's a song leader that leads something a little bit differently than what we're used to. We don't like it. Or there's a preacher that preaches something that's a little bit different. I don't like it. Are you hearing that? And we become old wineskins that can't handle something fresh. And my prayer for us is that we would not be old wineskins. Because when the fresh and the power and the life of it comes, we've got to be able to see the kingdom of heaven in it rather than, uh, they're not doing it the way I like. And it's not about them anymore, it's about me. And when God comes, friends, there is so much that comes with it. The grace, the truth, the life. But I want to be able to walk with him. And I've said to Neil many times, you know, I don't, I'm not ambitious, I don't need to be at the head, but I, gee, I want to be a part of it. I just want to be a part of this fresh move that comes and, and all that it has. And sometimes, you know, it might be different from my preferences. And every move of God that has come, the move that has been before it, the people there said that's different and they've persecuted it. Read your church history. It's all there. But I don't want to be like that. I want to be able to carry the expansiveness of it and the depth of it and the life of it that comes. When God comes, the starting place for me is to try and get a right spirit around my thinking that I'm not thinking judgment because I fall in that way easily. Hello? Just, just being honest, transparent with you. I fall into that very easily. But it will not carry the grace and life of God. And so I've got to put that thing to death, consider myself dead to sin. That thing is old sin thinking. I've got to die to judgmental thinking. I've got to die to my own preferences. I've got to pick up the cross. I've got to allow if there's something fresh of the spirit and God is on it, I've got to be mature enough to recognize God in it 
rather than just wanting my own preferences. Are you hearing this? God wants us to take us on, but if we're stuck in the old, that's where we'll be. Like children of Israel wandering through the wilderness, and every time they stopped, there was a bunch of graves. The old people died. The old generation died. The old nature has got to die. There's one answer for it called death. It's not very quiet in here. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. Spirit of God. I think I've said what I've ever said. Father, I thank you for your truth today. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Father, that you're helping us to embrace the new truth and the new life and the fresh revelation. God, you're still pouring out from, you're still given from heaven. You're still pouring out fresh revelation from heaven. You're still given to us, God. You're given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, but you're still given to us fresh revelation of who you are and your nature and your character. And I pray it would be live to us today, O oh God. We worship you and honour you. We thank you, Jesus, that when you wrote on the ground, on those tablets of stone, that you brought life both to those who were judged and to those who are in sin, that you brought grace and truth. Thank you, Jesus. That your mercies are new to us every day. We worship you and honour you. Jesus' marvellous name, amen. Yarabur Ruberella Babai Tariash Suja Zelebesh Yaharabir Yalakai. If you've been Spirit of God, I feel like there are people who who just identify on both sides of that. There are some who identify with the condemnation and the and the rejection and the and feel and put down. And there are others who identify with holding judgment and, and condemnation against others. And I want to, just want to release faith over you this morning. I want to release the grace of God to overcome to you this morning. Because we all need it. But as Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ in us is the one that helps us to overcome and bring victory in life. Christ in us. It, it's not by our own ability. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's true, Jesus, it always has been, always is. It's by His Spirit. What do we sing? Let's do it. How great is our God. Friends, if that's you, I'd just love to be able to pray with you and agree with you and release faith over you to overcome. Some are wrestling with, with judgment, with feeling hurt and wounded and wanting to judge others. Some are wrestling with the things that have been spoken into you. Rejection. Condemnation. Oh, majesty, let all the earth rejoice. If you'd come, I'd love to agree with you. Pray with you. He wraps himself in love. tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God oh we'll see how great how great is our God